In the 19th century, Ireland was considered the most hostile country on earth for Mormons. Despite repeated efforts, the church would fail to establish a foothold on the island, and the reasons behind this are varied and intriguing. In this episode, I'm going to delve into the history of Mormonism, and Mormonism in Ireland in particular. It's a largely forgotten history, but it's an exploration of Irish identity, our complex relationship with the Catholic Church, but also the scandals that have dogged Mormonism, notably the practice of polygamy in the 19th century, where Mormon men married multiple wives. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer. Now, before we start today's show, I just want to flag that next week, the exclusive supporter series on the outbreak of the Troubles begins. Starting on Thursdays, episodes will be released fortnightly, exclusively, for the show supporters on Patreon and Acast+. Plus. Now, I've just finished the series. It's over three hours of content, and I think it's probably one of the best I've made yet. So it's structured around conversations with Dr. Brian Hanley from the History Department of Trinity College Dublin. Brian has published two highly influential books on the topic, The Lost Revolution with Scott Miller and Boiling Volcano, which looks at the impact of the Troubles in the Republic. So this series is really going to be an expert's guide to the conflict. We'll be taking a deep dive beginning in the early 20th century and exploring how what seemed to be a normal, if unequal, society in Northern Ireland plunged into major violence over the course of a few years. If you're a supporter, you'll get that first episode on Patreon or Acast Plus next Thursday. If you're not a supporter, you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast or Acast Plus. I've links to those in the show notes below. And finally, before we kick off, I will say... I knew very little about Mormonism until relatively recently. However, late last year, I kind of fell into a bit of a rabbit hole exploring the history of the church. In terms of understanding Mormonism, I did find the podcast Mormon Stories a really useful resource, but I do have a full list of the sources I used below. Now, to kick off today's episode, I want to give you a sense of the early history of Mormonism in general before we look at Ireland. But there's a fascinating story that helps us understand this. And that's the story of an Irish conman who helped get the religion off the ground in the 1830s. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar. Now, before we dive into the story of Mormonism in Ireland, I just want to flag that my latest exclusive series for supporters kicks off next week. This is going to look at the outbreak of the Troubles in the 1960s, and it's based around conversations with Dr. Brian Hanley from the History Department of Trinity College, Dublin. The series is a deep dive, so we go all the way back to the origins of the conflict in the early 20th century and take the story up until 1972. Now, that series kicks off next Thursday, and episodes will be released fortnightly, exclusively for supporters on Patreon and Acast+. It's over three hours long, and having listened back to it, I think it's probably one of the best things I've made yet. Brian Hanley's contributions are amazing. I'm sure you're aware of Brian. He's been on the show multiple times before, but he's an expert on the topic of the Troubles. He's written two key books on it. You might be familiar with them. One is The Lost Revolution, A History of the Official IRA. He wrote that with Scott Miller. And then more recently, his book, Boiling Volcano, looks at the impact of the Troubles on the Republic of Ireland. So I would strongly recommend tuning into that. If you are a supporter, don't worry, you're going to get the first episode next Thursday. If you're not, you can really easily sign up at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast or Acast plus below. Finally, a word on the sources used for today's show. Prior to starting research for this episode, I knew very little about Mormonism. But late last year, I kind of fell into a bit of a rabbit hole exploring the history of the church. Now, in terms of understanding Mormonism, I found the podcast, Mormon Stories, very useful. And if you want to know more about any aspect of Mormonism, that should be your first stop. They have over a thousand episodes there. In terms of Mormon history in Ireland, I found the 1960s PhD thesis by Brent Barlow, very useful. And I relied a lot on that, particularly for the early history of the church in Ireland. I have a link to that in the show notes. For the section on Patrick Maguire, there's an excellent website operated by his descendants where they post lots of primary documents about him. I also have a link to that below. 
And finally, for kind of the conversation on modern Mormonism, I found Dr. Hazel O'Brien's writing on the church really useful. So all that said, let's begin the story, which takes us back to 1830s America and the role an Irish conman played in the early years of the Mormon church. In 1835, an Irish emigrant, Michael Chandler, arrived in the town of Kirtland, Ohio, with a somewhat unusual cargo. Two years previously, the 37-year-old had come into the possession of 11 Egyptian mummies and papyrus scrolls, a thick, paper-like material used for writing in the ancient world. Now, how Chandler had come by these artefacts is not entirely clear, but Europe and the US was undergoing what's often called Egyptomania in the early 19th century. The French and then the British had invaded Egypt and both had proceeded to loot the country of ancient artefacts which were then sold around the world, triggering what was a craze at the time. However, despite this interest in the ancient world, Michael Chandler, try as he may, struggled to find a buyer for the mummies and the papyrus. He would take the artefacts on tour through Pennsylvania and Ohio, but after two years he had only offloaded seven of the eleven mummies. That was until he arrived in the town of Kirtland, Ohio, in the summer of 1835. It was there he encountered an unusual buyer, but a buyer nonetheless. This was a small but rapidly growing religious sect known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Mormons. Then led by the 27-year-old Joseph Smith, a farm labourer from upstate New York who had proclaimed himself a prophet, the sect had an intense interest in biblical history and ancient Egypt. One of the group's sacred texts was something called the Book of Mormon, which the prophet Joseph Smith claimed had been given to him by an angel and it was written on golden tablets. The tablets had been inscribed with hieroglyphs, writing similar to the symbols on Chandler's papyrus scrolls, and then the prophet Joseph Smith had translated them. This became the Book of Mormon. Now, the Irishman Michael Chandler quickly realised that this group, led by Joseph Smith, might be a potential buyer for his artefacts. Possessing original Egyptian artefacts would undoubtedly lend credence to the new religion. But it seems that Michael Chandler may have connived with the prophet Joseph Smith to use the artefacts to boost the Mormon leader's aura and reputation. Chandler showed Smith the papyrus scrolls and then claimed the Mormon leader was the best translator he had ever seen. Now the truth of the matter was that neither Chandler nor Smith could decipher hieroglyphs. However, eager to offload the artefacts, the Irishman gave Joseph Smith a letter saying he was uniquely talented at translating the hieroglyphs. This may well have been part of a deal the two men hammered out because Smith and his Mormon following ultimately bought the mummies and the scrolls, paying the Irishman Michael Chandler a handsome fee of $2,400 for them. Now that Irishman, Michael Chandler, soon afterwards disappeared from history. He bought a farm and lived what seems to have been a very average, normal and uneventful life in rural Ohio. The same could not be said for Joseph Smith or his followers. The Mormon leader exploited the papyrus scrolls he had bought to their full potential. He spent years translating them, but the word translate was doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. Nevertheless, in 1842, he announced to the world that the scrolls he had bought from Michael Chandler were in fact something he was calling the Book of Abraham, a sort of semi-autobiographical account written by the biblical prophet Abraham. This would become a key part of Mormon theology in the 19th century and lent legitimacy to what was a fast-growing faith. In the 20th century, the actual papyrus scrolls Chandler had sold Smith resurfaced, and when scholars translated them, few were surprised that they had nothing to do with Abraham. Nevertheless, Joseph Smith by this point was long dead, and his religion was well established. Indeed, in the decades after Michael Chandler had sold him the ancient artefacts, Mormonism had grown rapidly, and its followers numbered in the tens of thousands within a few decades. Indeed, by the time the Irishman Michael Chandler died in 1866, the faith had become internationally famous. Missionaries spreading Joseph Smith's teachings had travelled as far as Chandler's native Ireland. Even before the Great Hunger, 
the first Mormon missionaries had been preaching on the island. However, somewhat ironically, even though an Irishman may have had a hand in its early days, Mormonism and its missionaries would find Irish society an extremely difficult and even hostile environment. While Mormonism was founded in the USA, by the 1830s missionaries had already been dispatched across the Atlantic Ocean to try and spread the faith to the United Kingdom. While the church had spread rapidly in the US, its missionaries would find the industrial cities of the north of England even more receptive to their preaching. By 1840 they had built up a church of 1400 members and launched a journal, the Millennial Star. A decade later, the church in England was even larger than the church in the United States. Now, buoyed on by this success, missionaries would then cross the Irish Sea to Ireland in 1840. They would find Ireland much tougher going, however. After two very brief visits in early 1840 by missionaries, Theodore Curtis was appointed the first full-time Mormon missionary to Ireland in late 1840. Curtis would base himself in the northeast around the city of Belfast, and this was a sensible choice. Of all Irish cities, Belfast was the most similar to the cities in the north of England where Mormonism had enjoyed so much success. It too was an emerging industrial centre, and its population were overwhelmingly Protestant. If England was anything to go by, during the first three years, the Mormons in Ireland could expect to secure around 700 converts. They had managed to build a church of 1,400 members in three years in England, where the population was slightly more than double that of Ireland. However, within a very brief period of time, it was clear whatever similarities may have existed between the Belfast area and England were only skin deep. Irish society was, beneath the surface, very different. The membership of the church in its early years was never more than 71, and indeed by 1841, four years after they had arrived, it was already declining. The reasons for this failure are complex and discussed later in the episode, but it's worth saying that even in its earliest days, when Mormonism was largely unknown, it was still treated with scepticism and hostility in Ireland. As early as December 1840, The Dublin Evening Post called the Mormon Church a sect of schemers and grovelling fanatics. Meanwhile, some Irish landlords, notably Lord Hillsborough in the North East, actively persecuted Mormons and stated he would sack any workers if they converted. While I will return to this issue about why Mormonism struggled in Ireland and why Irish society was so hostile, first I want to take the story through the mid and late 19th century. So the late 1840s and the catastrophe of the Great Hunger saw little change in Mormon fortunes in Ireland. They were unable to exploit the hardships people endured in the way some religions had. This was followed by several concerted drives to recruit new members through the 1850s and 1860s. The church would even branch out from Belfast and establish a presence in Dublin. Indeed, in the capital, they even opened their first premises, a bookshop at number 4 Anger Street but they would find Dublin an intensely hostile place. Students from Trinity College frequently attacked meetings, and on occasions, Mormons themselves were physically attacked. One missionary, Gilbert Clement, described 1850s Dublin as the most anti-Mormon place he had ever visited. Now, no one can fault the efforts of the numerous missionaries in Ireland in these years, but it was clear no matter what they did or how hard they tried, Irish society appeared disinterested in their message. Eventually, the church would close the Irish mission in 1867. In the 1860s, the Mormon journal, the Millennial Star, would pronounce their judgment on Ireland, stating that it was a dead beast and that being a Mormon on the island was like being chased like a mad dog. Why Ireland was so different to England for Mormon preachers has attracted commentary from various sources down the years. James Sloan, a US missionary in Ireland in the 1840s, pointed to the intense sectarian tensions and rivalry between the island's Catholics and Protestants as one reason. In the 1960s, the Mormon missionary and historian Brent Barlow pointed out that the Great Hunger was one reason why the church failed to convert in the early phase. 
Now, while both are undoubtedly true to a certain extent, I think it's worth elaborating on Sloan's argument that it was due to sectarianism. There's no doubt that Ireland was an intensely competitive environment when it came to religion in the 19th century. Sectarian tensions between the Catholic and Protestant church saw both try and expand their influence, and this undoubtedly must have squeezed the early Mormon missionaries. However, the issue also runs deeper than just sectarian tensions between the two main churches on the island. Religion in Ireland in the 19th, and indeed much of the 20th century, was not just an issue of theology and spirituality, it was also central to a person's wider identity as well. This was particularly the case with Catholics. When Mormon missionaries arrived in Ireland, Catholicism was emerging from two centuries of persecution. People had found themselves second-class citizens purely because of the religion they had been born into. Catholic emancipation had been one of the key political issues up to 1829. Now, in this situation, converting from Catholicism to Mormonism was not only seen as an act of betrayal to your religion, but also to your community and even to your ancestors. Converting, therefore, had major consequences. A convert could expect to lose friends and family. While people did convert to various religions, it's also worth bearing in mind Mormonism had very little to offer people in Ireland in the 19th century. The sense of betrayal conversion would have provoked was only exacerbated by the fact that the Mormon church had an intense hatred of Catholicism at the time. While these teachings have since been revised, in the 19th century, the Catholic church was considered to be the great and abominable church referenced in the Book of Mormon. Now, all these factors combined to leave the overwhelming majority of the Irish population, Catholics, dubious of Mormonism from the get-go. But it wasn't the only factor as to why the religion struggled in Ireland. Emigration, for example, played a role, although not in the way you might think. Through the 19th century, the Mormon church encouraged its members to emigrate to the USA. Therefore, the rate of emigration among Mormons was always higher than the general population, so the community was constantly ebbing away. Finally, in the later 19th century, there was a series of explosive revelations about the Mormon church. The impact of these tends to be downplayed by Mormons when they discuss Ireland. However, there's no doubt from the 1850s onwards the church was considered increasingly sinister by many. This was due to the Mormon position on polygamy. The church encouraged men to take several wives, and conversations and attitudes towards this is something that has dominated and shaped attitudes towards Mormonism since the 1840s, and it's worth exploring in more detail. In a 2014 interview, a Dublin Mormon stated that polygamy can be a controversial issue. This is undoubtedly the case. It's one of the things that people tend to know about Mormonism, that it once practiced polygamy. Now, in that 2014 interview, he went on to downplay the practice, saying it was something done by 5% of Mormon people for 20 years, 200 years ago. Now, this is just not accurate. It was far more commonplace and prevalent than this, and I think understanding polygamy and the attitudes towards it helps understand why there was growing hostility towards Mormonism in 19th century Ireland and indeed beyond. This saw a dynamic emerge that the more people found out about the church, the more hostile they became. So rumours that Mormons were practising polygamy had surrounded the church from its earliest days. Joseph Smith, the founder of the church, had never publicly admitted the fact he had multiple wives, But by the end of the 1840s, the allegations of Mormon polygamy were becoming more and more commonplace. Now, eventually, the church would not only admit that members were practicing polygamy, but also encouraged it as the ideal form of marriage in 1852. This shocked most people across Europe and America and hardened what were deep resentments towards the church across the world. It's hard to appreciate how scandalous this was at the time. But in the US, for example, the Republican Party platform of 1856 was based on a denunciation of what was called the twin relics of barbarism, and these were slavery and polygamy. In Ireland, discussions of Mormonism in newspapers increasingly focused on this issue of polygamy. Many feared that missionaries were the equivalent, I guess, of what we would call people smugglers today. 
that they were trying to convert young women to get them to move to the USA, where they would then be married off to older Mormon men who already had numerous wives. These fears were crystallised by the publication of two exposés by women who had been in Mormon polygamous marriages. The most damning of these books was called Wife No. 19, a book by Anne Eliza Young. Her husband had been none other than Brigham Young, the president or leader of the Mormon church in the mid-19th century. He had 56 wives and has an estimated 30,000 descendants today. Now his case is somewhat unique, but evidence suggests 28% of Mormon men in the 19th century were practicing polygamists, although it was more common to have two or three wives rather than the dozens church presidents like Smith or Young did. Now the association and endorsement of the practice of polygamy by the Mormon church undoubtedly became a major obstacle to conversions in the late 19th century. However, while Mormons were failing to find converts in Ireland, they did actually enjoy a greater degree of success among emigrants, so we'll talk about that next. The levels of emigration from Ireland during and after the Great Hunger is something I've discussed many times on the show. The numbers are truly staggering. Millions of Irish people crossed the Atlantic to North America in the latter half of the 19th century. Now in the 1960s, the historian Brent Barlow in his study of Irish Mormonism found evidence that these Irish emigrants were more likely to join the Mormon church than people living in Ireland. Barlow looked at the records of the Liverpool branch of the church. Now it's worth bearing in mind that Liverpool was the major transit port of the 19th century for Irish emigrants. Even the majority of those destined for Canada or the US would pass through Liverpool first, so the city had a large Irish emigrant population. Now in the years between 1840 and 1855, there were nearly 2,000 Mormon converts in Liverpool in total. Of those, 428 gave a place of origin, and 9% of those were Irish. Data from Glasgow was similar. The Mormon church converted 1,241 people there between 1840 and 1851, and of those, 18% who provided a place of origin were Irish. Now, obviously, these converts represented a tiny fraction of the overall number of emigrants, but still, it does suggest that emigrants were converting in larger numbers than people who lived in Ireland were. This is, when we think about it, pretty understandable. The process of emigration in the 1840s and 50s was fraught with risk and danger. It could be an isolating experience, leaving a person lonely in a strange environment. They would be far more willing to listen to a friendly face, while the stigma and ramifications of converting would be diminished once they left their home and community. There is another possible reason why emigrants were converting in larger numbers that's worth discussing, and that's the fact that the Mormon church not only encouraged converts to travel to the US, but was also willing to help fund emigration. For many Irish people who had reached Britain but could not afford the transatlantic passage, this may have been an additional incentive to convert to Mormonism. Now, while the church did enjoy limited success among Irish emigrants, next I want to focus on the life of one Irish emigrant who became a Mormon, whose life story is not only remarkable, but it also takes the story of Mormonism into the early 20th century. His life would also demonstrate how polygamy remained such a major issue for the church into the early decades of the 20th century. In 1910, Patrick Maguire arrived back in Ireland for what was only the second time since he had left as a child, 64 years earlier, at the height of the Great Hunger in 1847. Within a few months of arriving back to Ireland, he was interviewed by an Irish independent journalist, and there was no doubt Maguire had a truly remarkable story to tell. His parents had taken Patrick, then only aged three, with another sibling from their home in Derry Lahan in County Cavan in 1847. The family would endure a harrowing ordeal in Black 47. While they survived the transatlantic crossing, Patrick's mother and sibling died within two weeks of reaching Canada. His father would remarry and settle in Ontario, but Patrick would leave once he became an adult. 
At the age of 19, he crossed the US border, where he would lead a wide and varied life. He served in the quartermaster's department in the US Civil War. After the conflict, he travelled west, working on cattle ranches in Wyoming. He then worked as a labourer, building the Trans-Pacific Railroad, before moving to Salt Lake City in Utah in 1872. This final step to move to Utah in 1872 was a somewhat bizarre move for an Irish Catholic like Maguire. So through the late 1830s and 1840s, the early converts to Mormonism in the US had been heavily persecuted. They were driven from two Missouri towns by vigilantes. Then the prophet himself, Joseph Smith, had been murdered when they tried to establish themselves in Illinois. Under a new leadership, they moved into the West to what was then the territory of Utah, establishing headquarters at Salt Lake City. However, even there, tensions with the distant US government continued, leading to a low-level conflict called the Utah War. This saw a notorious incident called the Mountain Meadow Massacre, where a Mormon militia killed around 120 men, women and children in a wagon train passing through Utah. Now, while these tensions had eased by the 1870s when Patrick McGuire arrived in Utah, the increasingly Mormon territory was not seen as a friendly place to Irish Catholics like McGuire. Already dubious about Catholicism, tensions between Mormons and Irish Catholics had increased after an influx of thousands of Irish people into the West to work on the Trans-Pacific Railroad. The historian of the Irish in the West, David Emmons, has described how the Irish in general tended to avoid Utah where possible. Nevertheless, the famine emigrant, Patrick McGuire, would settle in Utah in a town 40 miles southeast of Salt Lake City called Daniel. And within a short period of time, he would actually convert to Mormonism and was baptised on January the 1st, 1873. And over the following decades, he prospered, rising from a farm labourer to a pretty prominent businessman. When he returned to Ireland in 1910, he was actually a pretty wealthy man and embodied the American dream in what was a real-life rags-to-riches story. However, when he sat down for an interview with the Irish Independent journalist in 1911, the conversation glided over his pretty remarkable life. Instead, it focused heavily on Maguire's Mormonism and specifically one issue in particular, polygamy. So under pressure from the US government, the Mormon church had actually issued a document known as the Manifesto, advising against polygamy in 1890, and then had issued an edict in 1904 threatening excommunication on polygamists. But even after this, they could not shake off the stigma of the practice. Fears continued that missionaries would take young women to Utah, where they would be married to polygamists. And when Patrick McGuire was asked about the issue, he didn't exactly allay the fears Irish people may have had. He actually would defend the practice of polygamy in principle and just said it was no longer practiced because of US law. The journalist then asked the next logical question of McGuire, had he ever been a polygamist? He answered no, but this was in fact a lie. In 1911, McGuire did only have one wife, but this wasn't always the case. After converting to Mormonism, he had married a woman called Sarah Parcel, and together they had had 11 children. However, 11 days before Sarah gave birth to their fourth child, he had actually married a second woman, Annie Lee, and they had had two children together before the marriage broke up in 1885. Indeed, Patrick McGuire illustrated how the ghost of polygamy continued to haunt the church into the 20th century and continued to be an obstacle to conversions. Even though the church had distanced itself from the practice, it was hard to condemn it. The founding fathers of Mormonism, who were regarded as prophets, had all been polygamists, and the issue, therefore, would linger in the background for decades. Now, in the final part of today's show, I want to look at how Mormonism has fared in the 20th century, because it has enjoyed some successes. When Patrick McGuire returned to Ireland in 1911, he was actually part of a renewed drive by the church to establish a following in Ireland. While there were considerable numbers of missionaries working across the island, they still found the country intensely hostile. Indeed, while the Mormons were organising a major drive at the time, there was also a concerted effort to get the religion banned across the United Kingdom. 
Now this would fail, but nevertheless, meetings were disrupted and attacked on occasion. In spite of these difficulties, the missionaries did enjoy some success and would claim 350 conversions by the end of World War I. However, in 1918, the drive ended with most missionaries, bar two, leaving Ireland. In any case, the following years would highlight another issue that would plague the Mormon church in Ireland through the 20th century, and this was the issue of politics. So as Irish society became increasingly divided around political issues as the War of Independence broke out in 1919, the Mormon church actually had very little to say on the matter, despite the fact it was a key issue of the day. The official position of the church was that it remained aloof from politics, but this left them removed from matters that affected everyday life. Now following on from independence, the Mormon church would find the Republic of Ireland, where the majority of the population were Catholic, an extremely difficult place to recruit. They did fare slightly better though in Northern Ireland. And in the aftermath of the Second World War, the church would enjoy what was perhaps its greatest period of expansion there. This was, in part at least, because the sinister associations of polygamy that had dogged the church in the 19th century were increasingly seen as a historic issue. The church was increasingly accepted as another minority religion, if a somewhat eccentric one, given its relatively recent origins. This perhaps explains why it enjoyed modest growth between the 1950s and the early 1970s in Northern Ireland. This growth would see new branches opened in Bangor, Derry and Portadown by 1961. It would also lead to the opening of an Irish mission. It had been part of the British mission up until this point. In 1967, the church would claim it had 104 members in the Republic, but a pretty large membership of 3,564 in the six counties of Northern Ireland. There's no doubt the church was growing in these years, although that figure has to be called into question. The 1961 census claimed that there were only 371 Mormons in both the Republic and Northern Ireland combined. If the Mormon church data was correct, this would mean that the church had grown tenfold in just six years when it claimed it had over 3,500 members in 1967. It also fails to explain why the 1971 census in Northern Ireland counted just 971 Mormons. Now, in more recent times, the church's growth appears to have been more focused in the Republic of Ireland. In 2022, it would claim it had nearly 4,000 members in the 26 counties of the Republic. Again, this is a major exaggeration. The 2022 census conducted in the Republic stated that just 1,111 people stated Mormonism was their faith. This includes children, so it suggests that there may be as two to 300 Mormon families living in the Republic. In Northern Ireland, the situation appears to be similar, where there's 1,180 Mormons. Now, the situation for the Mormon church is undoubtedly far healthier in the 21st century than it ever was in the 19th century, but it does face really major challenges going forward. While the crises that have dogged the Catholic church could, in some readings, provide an opening for the Mormon church, the words of the Irish Mormon, Ben O'Farrell, are revealing in this regard. He said on the matter, it seems that people have lost faith in faith. They don't just leave the Catholic Church, they leave faith. Further to this, Catholicism continues to form part of Irish identity, even among those who no longer believe in Catholic teaching. Dr. Hazel O'Brien, who has written extensively on Mormonism in Ireland, has highlighted how many Irish Catholics would see converting to another religion as an act of betrayal to their Irish identity even if they're not religious at all themselves. And this remains a major conundrum for other religions in Ireland. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot of ground in this episode, and there's a lot to think about in what we've talked about today. I'm going to leave it there. If you've any thoughts on this, please do get in touch at info at irishhistorypodcast.ie. Don't forget that series on the outbreak of the Troubles is also going to kick off next week, and you can get that in the links below. Lastly, sound on the show was by Kate Dunley. Until next time, Sloan. Mm-hmm.